Okay, this is one of my favorite exchange sacrifices because I don't get it, and the computer doesn't get it, and then the guy who's the exchange up resigns. So, okay, and this is, I'm sure, one of Gary's favorite games, Kasparov Shirov from 94 Horgan. And who is the only player with the black pieces not to lose to Kasparov in Horgan 94? You. It's all about the Benjamins. That's right. Okay. Although Joel told me that he put the Do Not Disturb sign on his hotel room and it kept getting taken off. We wake up, it was gone. People were knocking on his door all day. So it wasn't, it wasn't me. I wasn't there. Probably Gary, right? Okay. Now, as most of you know, Shirov has an excellent record against Kasparov. He didn't want to blemish it by ever winning. Okay. So it's not, not, a, not a good record. Okay, and somehow they transposed to the Shveshnikov. Somehow. Okay, so this is positions occurred many, 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 many times. In fact, Spencer had it last week, right? Yeah. Okay. And again, many, many times. Is this the main line now still? Yeah. Yeah, 19 years later? Yeah. Who would have thunk it? C4. Still the main line? C4 is now on the move? Okay, so C3, C3 still has more games than it, but C4 is catching up. Okay, now, as Iris will tell you, since we looked at similar positions today, like, that's good for white. See that knight there? Beautiful. You know what's not beautiful? Is that knight there? Okay, so that knight's good. Now we got to fix the other knight. So C3, the knight's going to go to C2 and go to some, somewhere good. There's too many annotations to this game because probably Kasparov did it, so. I think it was Fatachnik, actually. Bishop b7, knight c2, knight to b8. That's modern chess for you. <laughs> Remember when your opponent took your knight with his bishop? Although actually it was his knight. So this knight wants to go here, and maybe at some point we're going to capture that knight, because the knight here doesn't really have any squares. Question? What? No? OK, knight b8, a modern interpretation by Shirov. a4, following my rule, when their pawn's on b5, you play a4. Incidentally, threatening to win a pawn. Takes, and he took with the rook, and there's lots of annotations about not taking with the rook, but putting the knight here to solidify the center. Now we see black has an isolated pawn on a6, and a backward pawn on d6, but he has the two bishops. Although, I don't know, the bishop's a little suspicious here. Knight d7, rook to b4, solid. Threatening the bishop, obviously. And controlling b6? Terrible. Horrible. That's the kind of move I make in one minute, and it usually wins pretty quickly. But in slow chess, it never works. And there's lots of notes. My favorite note is the one that says bishop c6, rook c4. Well, knight c7 check is annoying. I've got to give it to him. Okay, so knight c5 makes sense to me. Rook takes b7. And when this move was played, I think I was watching the game live or I saw it the next day. And I was like, huh? And when I put it on my computer program, Houdini says, huh? What kind of move is that? And for the next few moves, Houdini just says that black is better. Okay, although not much better, just a little, tiny little better. Okay, there's a little tiny. And move by move, white's position becomes fantastic. So <clears throat> this is an exchange sacrifice, which I, I barely understand. But the idea is this knight's here forever. There's no bishop takes knight. And Kasparov is of the opinion that that knight is better than any rook. Also, this weakens the a6 pawn. We might take it later and get a pass b pawn, which I think actually happened. Um, although I'm not playing that exchange sac. And I'm giving the lecture. So that's. Yeah. So this is what we call a long-term exchange sacrifice. You're not getting any pawns. You're not getting anything immediate. You're just saying, I control all the white squares. I have a white square bishop. This bishop is terrible. This knight is terrible. How do we keep that knight to continue to be terrible? What move can white make so the knight's terrible forever? B4. B4. Now, the knight can't move anywhere. This bishop's not very good. And if we can round this pawn up with our knights and bishop and queen, we'll have a passed pawn. And I think the most important thing is the knight on d5 is just there forever. There's never going to be any trade. 
You know what I'm saying, Iris? You know what I mean? Yeah, Iris knows what I mean. Bishop g5, which is typical Sveshnikov move. Maybe black will play f5 later. Maybe the bishop will be good somehow. Knight a3, where's the knight going? c4. And he does. But feeling kind of like your knight, very suspicious. <laughs> a5, that's what I would have played. Makes sense. And he played bishop to d3. He wants to keep his pawn on b4, so this knight has nowhere to go. Not b5, knight to c5. Don't take the pawn. The knight, again, can go to c5 or take on a5. Takes, takes. And white has a passed pawn. Black got rid of his isolated pawn and activated his rook, but that's a poor knight. And again, an exchange sacrifice sometimes is just saying, my minor piece is better than your rook. And this minor piece probably wouldn't be here for 40 moves in a row if that bishop was there, especially with black playing a move like f5. So it's sort of a defensive sacrifice. He's making sure that black can't do anything and he's keeping a grip on the position. Queen to b8. The problem is to suggest a plan for black. Now, queen b8 makes sense to me because I'm worried about one thing. I'm worried about this knight on b7. I want to put my knight on b7 somewhere good, like c6 or e6. Knight d8, knight e6, knight c6. Question. Oh, you agree? Yeah, you agree. So queen, okay, so the knight's going to go to d8 and get to a normal square. h4, Kasparov's like, well, if you put your pieces over here, I'm going to play over here. Now, I man, I don't know, where's that bishop go? I would probably go to h6, although I don't play black in a Sveshnikov. Is that right, Spencer, bishop h6? Tony, you play Sveshnikov. Bishop h6? Okay. And that's what he did. Knight b6, attacking the rook. Should black sacrifice the exchange back? Well, if he does, if he does, yeah, like he has to. If he does, then these are the, these are, white has this nice pass pawn and black has that pawn. And yeah, as you pointed out, he can't really do anything about it. Knight d7 is coming. Terrible. <clears throat> and he just castles. Because if he plays knight d7, Queen a7, now queen f2 mate is annoying. And rook a1 may be annoying. So after castles, black can move his rook off of f8. Castles. Rook to d2. That Shirov is tough, except when he's playing Kasparov, then he's less tough. But when he's not playing him, he's tough. Queen f3. Queen a7. Queen's a little suspicious over there. Knight d7. Now what do we do? How do we save our rook on f8? If you move the rook, I think knight e7 check and queen f7 is probably good for white. That looks dangerous. But maybe he did move his rook. Ah, look at all these variations. No. So rook d8, well, let's see what they are. I didn't put him there. Somebody did. What happens on rook takes d3? Since I don't know. Knight c6? Knight f6? Knight f8? After knight f8, how do you stop queen g8 mate? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So, that's right, so we stopped it. G6, man, that's a scary looking defense there. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> okay, so he didn't do that. He also gives queen a3, knight f8, take on d3, queen f7. Also looking pretty good for white. I don't know about that knight on b7. Man, now the exchange sacrifice makes sense 20 moves later. And the other line is... Rook a8, bishop c4, bam.
Yeah, and the rook's trapped, so bishop's trapped. Everything's trapped. Okay, so instead he played in this position, knight d8. That seems like it avoids getting mated and the knight gets to a good square. Cool. B5, it's funny, now he's stopping knight c6. He's so mean. And then b6 is coming, terrible. Queen f5, and taking the bishop is dangerous. Queen d7 threatening, mate everywhere. Queen e7's mate, queen d8's mate. I don't know what you do here. He actually gave a move, g6. OK, I didn't see g6. And then black's game isn't good. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. What about What position? Queen e7, queen e8, knight e7, queen f8. Uh, yeah. one, only one square at a time. I can't do two squares. Yeah. And I think queen c8 was much quicker <laughs> on move one and then knight d8. Then I go to d7 to tease you. OK. All right. So and in fact, he gave that line, but I still ignored it. All right. So queen f5, he doesn't want to get mated. So king e8, setting up for the next game. Bishop c4. Man, now he's not down the exchange anymore. I don't know. I hate when that happens. And now the lecture will be on black sacrificing the exchange, <laughs> except it was an accident. Man, because Sparrow doesn't just move his knight away and win. He's like, I got to sack more and play for mate. <laughs> and instead of playing. Queen c4, and then queen e8 check, super precise. He keeps analyzing? Man, queen c6, solid. All right, so instead of doing that, he plays queen d4, rook a3, with the same queen takes knight, rook a7 idea. Knight e3, threatening knight f5 check. See iris, first there was d5, and now there's f5. And somehow, Shirov's exchange sacrifice not as good as Kasparov's <laughs> and resigns. But I still don't get rook takes b7. I don't get it. <laughs> Although maybe I do get it. Yeah. It's funny. He not only killed the, the knight on, on b7, he killed his bishop on h6, too. That bishop wasn't defending e7 or d8. I hate when that happens. Now, the least understandable game is this one. Uh, wait, my comer might come in. Control F? That doesn't work. Okay. Uh, this is a hedgehog where uh, Olaf Anderson sacrifices in exchange for no reason. And then he wins, I guess, for my lecture. I don't know. Okay. And he gets the dark squares. Ooh. Okay. So this is Karpov, Olaf Anderson. If you want to play Olaf Anderson one minute, go on the ICC and play Berta. You'll win on time, but your game won't be very good. But you'll win on time. OK, so this is like the movie. Man, I made this joke a lot, but this movie's getting old. What's the movie in the woods, and they have a camera that's fake, but they pretend it's real? Uh, Blair Witch. Blair Witch. Yeah. yeah, this game's like the Blair Witch Project. Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, it's over. OK. All right, so nothing ever happens this game until it happens. Yeah, this is a hedgehog, so nothing's going to happen. Did Black just move all his pieces around in a circle? <laughs> OK, so d5. In the hedgehog, when something does happen, Black plays either d5 or b5, and then things happen, sometimes sacrificing material. OK, now, one of the ideas behind the pawn sacrifice d5 is our bishop gets to go to d6. And that's why in hedgehogs today, they're usually playing bishop c7, a d8 to c7, instead of bishop f8. Then they're already on this diagonal. And this rook, which you guys are confused as to why it's here, is opened up. And since it's an exchange sacrifice lecture, we're, we're ready to sacrifice the exchange. OK, bishop d6, threatening the pawn on h2. So he plays knight f1, doesn't want to lose his pawn. 
And then rook takes e3, bam. And I asked Olaf, why did you do that? He says, aren't you lecturing on this? So he, was, <laughs> and he wanted to help me up. OK, so this is the longest of the long-term positional exchange sacrifices. He's just like, you got your pawn on f3. You weakened the dark squares around your king. I'm taking that. In fact, this idea of sacking on d5 and attacking h2 and e3, this is how Kasparov beat Karpov 20 years later. Same ideas in the King's Indian. Queen takes, knight takes, exclam, knight takes, exclam. OK, well, queen takes, then it's not even an exchange sacrifice. We could actually play here and take the rook. So that can't happen. That would be bad for the lecture. Knight takes, bishop h2. So the king is permanently weakened. The dark squares aren't defensible. This knight can go to g3. The bishop can go to g3. And more importantly than all of black's obvious compensation is the fact, which we saw in the other games, the white rooks just aren't doing it. Black is sacrificing a rook for a minor piece. But in effect, he's saying, my minor piece is better than your rook. What's your rook doing? Now, if they trade queens and white's king gets safe, then white has good winning chances. But with the queens on the board and this king being perpetually open to this bishop on the diagonal, this bishop on the diagonal, this g3 square, what are white's rooks doing? So this is a long-term compensation. Knight f1, kicking him out. He saves his rook b5. And again, you want to play knight b6, take the pawn on d5, take away the c4 square, gain some space. He's not in a hurry. If you ever played Olf Anderson, and I have, he's not in a hurry. In a one minute game, he's still not in a hurry. <laughs> His move 12 or 14, you probably want on time. He's not in a hurry. Okay. Now, the funniest Olf Anderson story I have, and I have many, now I only have one. Uh, back in the day when I lived in Europe, I was at a tournament in Holland, and he was there, I think, he, I don't know if he was playing or in the press room. I think he was just in the press room. And computers played on the, on the com there were chess engines that played on the computer. And this was a long time ago. Well, Wolf Anderson's, oh, I got to play one of those. So he put it at five minutes each, and he's playing it. He's just playing the computer. And yeah, it's move 12, 15, and he's got like five seconds left. So he adds another five minutes, because it's, you know, it's on his computer. And he plays another 10 moves, and he's got another five, puts, gives him another five minutes. And he kept giving himself five more minutes. The computer never had more time. And the game was really boring. It was like some, like this. It was like move around and around and around. But I'll give myself five more minutes. He kept giving himself five minutes. So it was like an hour to five minutes the game. And I think the game ended in a draw. He moved around and around. So yeah, he, he doesn't want to play too fast. Now, a lot of people, when they sacrifice material, they have to see the winning knockout blow punch or they're not going to do it. Okay? If you sacrifice a piece or a rook, I tend to agree with you. But if you're sacrificing the exchange, you know, you got a bishop and your opponent has a rook. It's not the end of the world. If you go to an ending with rook versus bishop, then you're probably going to lose. But when there's all these pieces on the board, there's not a big hurry for black to win more material. Bishop d3, knight b6, as even I said. Knight c4. And again, nothing, nothing ever happens. I just have dark square control. Knight a2, question mark. Trying to go to b4, c6. Uh-oh, here comes rook h5. Doesn't look good. And now move 40, always the losing move. Although I think he played the right move. Is b the move he played? Yeah. yeah. So knight g3 would be a mistake, because rook, that looks terrible for white. Who would play knight g3? That looks awful. Man, this is looking tough for white. Why Karpov play knight a2? Terrible. Sacrificing. Yeah, mate's good. I guess if queen takes, it's the same mate, or we can sack the rook, queen h2 mate. Yeah, that's also good. In fact, yeah, then otherwise queen g1 and white's, white's still playing. Yeah, if queen takes bishop, rook h2 and rook h1 and queen h2 mate. OK, so Karpov didn't blunder. He played g3. Man, that king's looking a little iffy. Queen e8, threatening the e4 pawn. Rook e1. 
Bishop to b7, that's my kind of move. We can go to c8 and g4, h3. We can go to a6. Now the knight comes to g5. And basically, you know, this bishop on the dark squares is, is worth a rook. Look where the white rooks are. Are they active? Are they attacking? They're defending an e4 pawn. Who, need, who needs rooks? King f2, the best move, I guess. And now he should have played queen e7, it says, to get his queen over to f6. And we're not down the exchange anymore. Now we're up two pieces for a rook. So instead he played bishop d2, which is also good. Won his exchange back. And black's a pawn up, and white's king is ridiculous, frankly. Bishop C, that's my kind of move. Getting the bishop to better pastures. And we're no longer down in exchange. Ah, rook f1 check. Those computers. And then if king takes, bishop here check wins the queen. And king e3 looks a little iffy to me. Bishop f5, dubious. Rook f1, winning. So he's making Karpov suffer. It's funny, even not down the exchange, White's rook is still not doing very much. Finally, a threat. Queen f3, dubious. Man, Ulf Anderson, good positional player. Tactical, not so good. This is what he should have done. That's what he should have done. But he played queen f3, making him suffer some more. Man, that's a lot of suffering. And he resigned, finally, because of king d2, only legal move. Check, check, and check. Hooray. And that's what we call a positional exchange sacrifice, which took 75 moves to figure out how to win. <laughs> but the point was, he had control of the dark squares the whole game. And in the hedgehog, getting your bishop open on this diagonal or this diagonal, that's worth material. And if we can go back a little earlier, well, I mean a lot earlier, Let's just leave and come back. Yeah, the way, the way they're playing the hedgehog now in these types of positions is instead of playing rook e8 and bishop f8 is, uh, well, usually this knight is here, but it took him a few moves to do that, is they're playing rook c8, queen c7, queen b8, then bishop here, bishop here. The queen and bishop are lined up, and then we try to play d5. And that's one of the problems with white in this kind of hedgehog. When the bishop's fee enkettoed, there's a pawn on g3. When the bishop is here, g3 doesn't make any sense. If you don't play g3, you're going to have to play h3 or lose your h pawn. And then you're making some weaknesses at your king there. So if Karpov was a better positional player, then he could have been OK. But <laughs> now, since I'm, since I'm dissing Karpov, and his, he's on the wall and I'm not, we're going to show one of my favorite games from Karpov. And now I'm going to diss Kasparov brutally here. Yeah, I wish he was here so I could make fun of him. Okay, so Kasparov said before this tournament, whoever wins this tournament is the best tournament player in the world. Specifically this tournament, Linares 94. All the, all the best players were there. Anand was like the worst. Like, why was he invited? Okay, and Karpov crushed everybody. <laughs> the smacked, and he got like 10 out of 13. So he got like two points worth of Kasparov. Before the tournament, Kasparov is like, this tournament will decide. Then he, uh, he forgot he said that. Now, this is one of my favorite Karpov game uh, that has some tactics in it. Most of his games are sort of like he grinds you out. This is against Topolov. Before Topolov was Topolov. Maybe he wasn't cheating it. I don't know. OK. No, those are just rumors. OK. Nobody from Bulgaria would ever cheat at the top level. 
Now, of course, I'm making fun of, uh, what's his name, Borislav? Well, Ivanov's his last name. Uh, I recently became friends with French Grand Master Romain Edouard on, I, on uh, Facebook. And the reason was, he said, I'm going to a tournament in a few days, and I see Ivanov is pre-registered. And he actually got him unpre-registered. He's been banned from the tournament, even though they can't really legally ban They ban him anyway. He's actually banned in Bulgaria, but not any other country. So, but yeah. Man, Ivanov, I don't want to say anything on, on camera. He's the biggest cheater ever, ever. He's the world champion of cheating. He should be in true romance. He's the world heavyweight champion of cheating. Okay. That guy, okay, here's how he's cheating. Here's how you know he's cheating. Not because his moves are good, not because they're computer moves, not because he wins. That's not why I know he's cheating. When they show him playing, he's like this. And then he makes a move. You do that. Play chess and don't move your head and don't move your eyes. See how good you play. Just sit like this and see how well you play. Right? He, never, he never looks at other games, never moves his, never sits up his chair, just like this. Because, you know, they gotta see, someone's got to see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, that's funny watching a video of him playing. Okay, so this is Karpov Topolov. And there will be no Benonis today or 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's a boring opening, we know. Man, 20 years ago, this was a bad position to have against Karpov with black, terrible. Passive and solid, that's not what you wanted against Karpov. You wanted like unclear, complicated, Karpov gets into time trouble, not, not this. Okay, knight h5. Karpov's like, whatever, e3. And now after takes, e takes, this just, it just puts a clamp on these squares, open files, and this bishop is terrible. So very instructive. I've never seen this e3, ef, and this variation. I like it. And just plays like Karpov, nothing special, puts his rooks in the middle. Okay, he was gonna play f5 next move. So, nope, h4, h5, softens him up. Topolov can't take it anymore, b5, he can't take it. He's gotta get activity. And now, with the h pawns gone, this is all softened up here. This pawn can easily get overloaded. Now, I'm sure all of you were here last month for my lecture on my game with Fidel Harales Jimenez, right? And in that game, I took on e6, he played f6, e I played queen g6, and I mated him thereafter. Knight c5, bam. So Karpov maneuvering his knights to better squares, but Topolov doesn't handle that. He just takes it, takes. Now there's some slight pressure here on c6. And this actually had to be calculated very accurately because white doesn't want to lose his queen. That would be bad. Rook c8, and the idea is, well, Topolov's idea, if you take the knight, then I can attack the queen, rook c7 or rook a7, the queen moves away, then I take back, and black is fine. Now, when you think of Karpov, you think wild, aggressive tactician, right? <laughs> Indeed. So what did Karpov do in this position? Hmm? Rook takes e6. Indeed. Yeah, the problem is black, black put all his, I, I can stand right here. Black's pieces are all over there. Okay, not good. If all your pieces are over here, then your king's gonna get in trouble. And he's going to sacrifice his rook again if it's not taken. He's got another place to sacrifice it. So, yeah, this exchange sacrifice is working out quite well. We're going to checkmate our opponent and take all their pawns. If we don't checkmate them, we're still winning because black's rooks are terrible. Rook a7. And now what? Rook g6. If I remember correctly, that's right. I've been wrong before. Rook g6. Now king h8, queen h3 is the funniest. That's the funniest. And the problem is, when you do take my rook, I'm going to win this knight, and I'm sort of ahead material. 
King h7, do you play king h7? No. If king h7, Karpov gives you the smackdown. Check. Oh, actually it says rook g4 is even better. Rook g4, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And then rook h1 mate. Oh, damn. That's a safe king, but not too safe. Yeah, no, two pawns. Two pawns. Yeah. Okay, but okay, I, I, I'm guessing that wasn't what Karpov was planning. He was probably thinking everything wins, and he, you know, this, this is more likely what he was thinking. You know, that easily winning, nothing to calculate. Yeah. But I would be shocked if Karpov hacked his queen and played king g2. <laughs> Hikara would do that, not, not Karpov. Okay, so fg6 takes, and okay, black is just crushed. This is a great exchange sack because you're sort of ahead material to start with. And as Yasser would say, as he said so many times before, when it's opposite colored bishops, the attack is even stronger. It's hard to defend g6. And if you know the famous white square symphony game between Karpov and Kasparov, Karpov gets his queen and bishop in there with regularity. Rook d8, and now Karpov starts taking things, <laughs> greedy. Bam, still taking stuff. Rook d1 I like. Like, oh, my rook's not good on a1. Let's go to d1. And now, after queen takes a6, you thought I was done. You thought this is the last game in my lecture, and I already showed you the exchange sacrifice. Ah, but you only thought I showed you the exchange sacrifice. Bam. Rook takes d4. Karpov was given two rooks, so he could sacrifice two exchanges. <laughs> yeah. yeah, now, man, it's not easy to defend when all the guy's pieces are all over you there. Yeah, that bishop on d4 was pretty good. Not anymore. So it's funny. You sacrifice the exchange because you're, you want to get a good minor piece. Then when your opponent gets a better minor piece, you sacrifice it again. Just for the other reason, like that bishop was good on d4. Get rid of that. All right, which way do we take? The answer is it doesn't matter. Okay, he took with the rook. If he takes with the pawn, queen f6, check. Picks up the rook on d8 with mate, I think. Man, terrible. Okay, so he takes with the rook, check. Doesn't matter what he does. And all his pawns are gone. Aw. And there's no more pawns. And now we have a bishop and five pawns for a rook. And uh, the only person who would like black here is Verge. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because it's true. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't get that, uh, how many days ago was the tournament? Saturday, yeah. On Saturday, Verge had a rook for bishop and four pawns, and he won. So he's like, yeah, I won. I don't know. <laughs> B3. Aha. <laughs> That'll show him. <laughs> king G2. Yeah. After King G2, he's like, I had enough. Because <laughs> the queen's defending this and uh, down five pawns. Although if it was Karpov Verge, we'd have seen a lot more moves. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like that game because he sacked two exchanges and he beat Topolov. And he won the tournament by like a million points. He beat everybody that tournament. So uh, that, to me, that was his greatest tournament ever. But... This exchange sacrifice and the second one were for different reasons. The first exchange sacrifice actually won material. The second one was the bishop on d4 was black's only good piece. It was pressuring f2. It was defending f6. It had to go. And then, you know, usually five pawns is good comp. <laughs> <laughs>